unexpectedly today, his eminence Cardinal Pell passed away at age 81. It's a surprise. He was visiting Rome for the funeral of Pope Benedict XVI to pay his regard. And he had also scheduled a hip surgery, a replacement hip surgery. And the story that I've gotten, it could be incorrect, but the story I've heard is he had a successful hip surgery. Afterwards, he was speaking to the doctor about the successful hip surgery, and he died suddenly. That's all we have. His secretary has released that he's died, and the Holy See has acknowledged that Cardinal Pell has died. So that's Dr. Taylor Marshall from the Dr. Taylor Marshall Show um, confirming the death of Cardinal Pell from Australia on while he was visiting Rome for the funeral of Pope Benedict. Today is January 11th, 2023, Anno Domini. So you've got Cardinal Pell passes away in Rome for the funeral of Pope Emeritus, Pope Benedict. More writings now have been released from both Cardinal Pell and Pope Benedict. And this is what we need to get into. And in order to do this, I want to bring on Libby Emmons, First show of the year, Libby. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Jack. Happy to be here. So we're going to dig into this. We've also got some news from Libby that we're going to break down in the next segment. But first up, Cardinal Pell wrote an article, apparently, for The Spectator. Now, we don't know if he was on his deathbed writing this because it seems as though this was a surprise. Um, but he may have known that his number was was coming up soon because he wrote an article to be published posthumously. It later came out in The Spectator. He wrote denouncing the current neo-Marxist agenda of Pope Francis, the synodism of the church, which he says is completely anti-tradition, it's anti-scripture, anti-theological. And he wrote, the Catholic church must free itself from this toxic nightmare. This is a member, by the way, Cardinal Pell was one of the former members of the inner circle of Pope Francis himself, our first Jesuit Pope. And even perhaps more Drastically, we've now received, and this is from the American Conservative, we've received an excerpt from a letter that was written by Pope Benedict before he passed that has never been revealed until today. And Pope Benedict wrote in this letter, which was released right around the time of his funeral, obviously after his passing. He wrote that we are now living in the time of the Antichrist. Benedict wrote, we see how the power of the Antichrist is expanding, and we can only pray that the Lord will give us strong shepherds who will defend his church in the hour of need from the power of evil. Um, Pope Benedict throughout his life was an eschatologist. He wrote and studied the end times. He studied the signs of the end times. He wrote about how the Antichrist he believed would come as a theologian, someone who quotes scripture the way the devil does in the book of Matthew, in the gospel of Matthew, in when he tempts Jesus in the wilderness, he wrote that the Antichrist would come as benevolent, as a humanist, and potentially that the Antichrist would come from within the church itself. Libby Emmons, I know it's your first show back, but what do you think about these, these revelations and the fact that you have someone as high as the Pope himself writing that we are living in the time of the Antichrist? I think it's absolutely fascinating. And what you point out about the time that Jesus spent in the desert when he was tempted by Satan repeatedly, um, that's actually some of my favorite uh, stories in the Bible entirely. Um, the Lenten season is the most celebratory time of the year, I find in my heart, um, with the with trying to live up to Christ's example rejecting Satan, Christ's example of um, trusting God in all things. And it is really stunning to look at this and uh, wonder if we really are living in the time of the Antichrist. That's something for my whole life since childhood, I've been uh, a bit terrified, I'm, <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say, of this idea that we could all be uh, collectively led astray by someone who has that kind of darkness in their heart. Um, and I, I think it's definitely worth an examination. So this idea, this eschatology that 
you know, it's the study of the end, the study of the end of all things. And that really is the, the, the word apocalypse um, for us comes from the Greek, the word apocalypsis, which of course just means revelation. And so the book of Revelation, by when it was written by the Apostle John on the island of Patmos, he was writing about the final revelation. And so when we talk about this, we have to understand that these are the signs we're all looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it, it's sort of stunning. I'm sort of blown away by it, honestly. That's why I'm a little bit speechless. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, <laughs> it's certainly what should we, what should we, all right. For you, for you as a mom though, for you as a mom, mm -hmm. when you hear something like that, what does it make you think? Um, you know, I try to teach my son to, uh, trust God really to look for faith and to, um, not be discouraged when he can't find it in himself. I think that doubt is really an essential part of catechism. And there was a time um, at the end of Mother Teresa's life where she expressed concerns, where she expressed doubt. And to me, that gave me a lot of hope. Um, and it gave me even more faith, honestly, because I thought if someone who does the kinds of good works that Mother Teresa does can experience doubt, can be concerned that perhaps she has been wrong in her trust in God, perhaps she's been wrong in her faith, then it made me feel a lot better about my own doubts that I have had over um, over my time in faith and my time in the church. You know, so this, yeah, this idea that uh, we could be living in the time of the Antichrist, it's also possible too, though, because we are, as a human race, we're constantly obsessed with the end times. We're constantly looking for that moment in history that we are living through that makes our time so unique. We're obsessed with our own end. We're really uh, constantly trying to figure out what the end of the world is going to be like. There's a play actually by a playwright called Len Jenkin called Dark Ride. And at the end, you have the characters repeatedly saying, I don't care about philosophy, just tell me how it ends. And I think something that's something we're always looking for. We're always desperate to know what the end of the world looks like, uh, what the end of our own lives looks like. It feels like we're speeding at, um, you know, the, the speed of a bullet to get to the end of things. And to Indeed. And, what, and, what and, like. and as yeah. we are at the end of things in the same way that we are at the end of our segment. But uh, <laughs> before we head out, you know, what I'll just say is, as the Lord tells us, he will come like a thief in the night. We never know. And so it's incumbent on us to always be ready, to always be prayerful, to always understand that our time may one day be up. And we're back. So Libby Emmons, I've got to ask you, um, you posted something on the Post Millennial this morning that I've known about, has been in the works for a little bit. I can see that your background has changed just a little bit since the last time we've had you on. Tell us about the piece that you just wrote. It seems like a very personal piece that you just published up at the Post Millennial. It was very personal. I moved out of New York. I um, moved into a home of my own in a red state um, in a little town where my son goes outside to play after school. Uh, he barely knows where his Xbox is right now. Uh, and um, he's thriving and happy. And I could not be more overjoyed that my son is happy. Um, You're beaming right now, Libby. You're actually I'm beaming. I'm very happy. I'm very happy because. As any parent will tell you, right, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. And yeah. I only have one child and he's doing great. So I'm thrilled beyond measure that he's doing so well. And so I when I said get out of cities house. and I <laughs> when I kept saying get out of cities, get out of cities, get out of cities, you decided to actually take me literally. I actually did take you literally. And to be honest, I never thought in my entire life that I would leave New York City. From the time I was little, my mom lived on West 66th Street uptown. She lived right near Tower Records. She lived across from Lincoln Center. She owned her own apartment. Um, I loved visiting her there. I didn't grow up there. I loved visiting her. I grew up in Massachusetts. I spent summer vacations in New York City. I spent uh, school um, breaks and holidays in New York City. 
And uh, my mother was born in New York City. My grandparents were born in New York City. My great grandparents immigrated from Italy to New York City. They opened their businesses there. My great grandfather, one of my great grandfathers, owned a grocery store on um, 34th Street. And he eventually sold the space to Macy's, which then opened Macy's. Uh, my other great grandfather opened several bakeries in New York City, one after the other. Each each one kept failing. And so, he finally opened one in Brooklyn. <laughs> so you've got a lot of family history there, a lot, a lot of, of roots. Family history. You've lived in That's New York right. and you were in the piece for about, about 20 years, about the last 20 years you've been in New York. Yeah, I've been a permanent so resident me, for 20 years. Walk me through then. In in a, a you know and, and summarize because the piece is just amazing. You wrote in the piece, and this I think is the best line. You said you left the sirens of New York for the church bells of small town America. Walk us through the thought process and then the feeling when you got to where you are now. I I was very stunned that I left New York every step of the way. I found it sort of shocking. I kept having to realize that I was leaving. But it wasn't until the day after New Year's that I realized uh, that I hadn't just left someplace. I had arrived somewhere else. I was sitting here in my little office that I share with my son. We set it up. I had the window open and I heard church bells. It had been decades since I heard church bells um, in New York City. I hear the calls to prayer from the mosque nearby. I hear lots of screaming. I hear cats and traffic and cursing and all sorts of things. And I heard church bells. And then I realized that the church bells were actually playing Christmas carols. The church bells were playing Christmas carols. And I had never heard church bells playing Christmas carols. I realized in that moment that I had come to a place where my culture exists, that my culture, neither in the arts nor, you know, particularly religiously, culturally existed anymore in New York City. And here I was listening to Christmas carols on a crisp winter's day coming through my window. And I felt my heart lift. I felt my eyes sting with this recognition. Um, and it was really very joyous. And then, then my son ran by the window, uh, skidding on an office chair on the porch. So that was <laughs> really funny. <laughs> I can actually and picture him doing the, that too, by the, the way. Spell. Yeah, but it was very surprising, um, very surprising to leave, very surprising then to uh, walk me through Walk me through the decision process, right? Because you're a mom, uh, you've got your son. Why Why leave New York now? Was it Was it COVID? Was it the lockdowns? Was it the vaccine mandates? Is it the crime? Is there, or is it just sort of all of that? It was kind of everything all at once. I was no longer part of the theater community. I moved to New York City to make art, to make theater. That community um, is not one that I'm a part of. And the art that I see coming out of it is certainly not something that I want to be a part of. Uh, school shut down halfway through fourth grade for my son. And even though he's been back, there's really just no education happening at the school where he was. 36 kids in his class because there were two teachers in the class that allowed them to have all of these uh, extra kids. There was no personal attention. He would come home and tell me that his teacher kept the kids in the classroom after the bell rang because there were fights in the hall. Um, lunches were terrible. Uh, it just was not working out for him. And that was a huge deal. Also, the city has changed drastically. And that did happen under de Blasio and COVID. The subways are not as safe as they were. Plus, the infrastructure of the subway system itself has entirely veered off course so that you could be on a train that you think is running express only to find five stops into your express train that it's now going to run local and you're going to be 45 minutes for whatever it was you thought you were trying to do. Uh, Uber rides home in the middle of the night, uh, $80, things like this. Um, so yeah, it was the, definitely the lifestyle that I had come to New York to have no longer existed. It at least no longer existed for me. And it definitely did not exist for my son. It was at the point where I certainly, he's of the age where I should be able to say, go ahead to the park with your friends and come home when you're ready. And there was just not the possibility of doing that. The park was not a safe place for him to do, um, you know, to go play, to to walk over to. 
Uh, there's definitely no playing with Nerf guns in the park because you have to worry that you might get shot. Um, and certainly, you know, his friends who are are brown, like they have to worry about getting shot as well. We've seen that. Um, so there were all kinds of concerns, education, lifestyle, crime. Also, the political leanings of the city are so horrific. Uh, I definitely did not want my tax dollars to be paying for women for, uh, from other states to come to the city and get abortions. That's something Kathy Hochul, the governor of the state, really wants to have happen. Libby, I just got to say, <laughs> we're running out of time, but I just got to say, God bless you. I, it sounds like you're absolutely thriving. You've gone and you're not having culture shock. I think you're having uh, culture discovery, cultural rebirth yes. in a yes. sense. And it, it's great to see. We can't wait to come visit you. We have to come out for a play date. Uh, Yay. With Jack